All right, so before we actually dive into Windows, it's important to understand a little bit about the history and evolution. So it all kind of started back in 1981, where Microsoft introduced what's called DOS, or the Disk Operating System. This started with MS-DOS 1.0, and this marked a pretty significant milestone in computing, as it fundamentally provided a way for users to interact with computers through the command line interface, or the CLI. And DOS required users to input text-based commands, which the system would interpret and execute. And then we kind of roll around to 1985 with the release of Windows 1.0. And this version marked a significant departure from the command line interface. In fact, it was essentially entirely a graphical user interface or GUI at that time. And this started to provide the ability to handle basic multitasking with a lot less requirement of the user to understand and memorize commands and instructions. And this truly was a fundamental shift that paved the way for more user-friendly interactions and what we see today. And then there were years of iterations and a series of refinement that actually took place. We saw this through subsequent versions such as Windows 3.0, 3.1, and Windows 95. Windows 95 was a bit of a game-changing release. This brought about significant advancements in the GUI. These releases introduced features like improved taskbars, start menus, and enhanced graphical elements. And these refinements not only improved the aesthetics, but also enhanced the overall user experience and ease of navigation. And then we saw some iterations like Windows XP and Windows 7, which Microsoft really started to prioritize stability and compatibility. These versions were characterized by smoother performance, improved hardware support, and streamlined interfaces. And this focus on stability contributed to the widespread adoption and popularity among users across the globe. And then we came up to Windows 8, which released in 2012, actually. And this aimed to adapt to the changing landscape of touch-based devices, which were all the rage really around this time, touch-based phones, tablets, kiosks, and as a result, Windows 8 introduced a more touch-centric interface and live tiles that you could just point with your finger and interact with. In contrast, Windows 10 came out and launched in 2015, and this brought Windows back to where it was previously, as Windows 8 wasn't truly too well received by the general user base, and Windows 10 pursued the vision of unifying experiences across various devices instead. Windows 10 emphasized both traditional desktop environments and modern app-based interfaces, and this really fostered a seamless transition between different devices at the time. And finally, now we're at Windows 11, which is the latest iteration released in 2021. And this represents a continuation of the Windows 10 foundation, really. However, it brings substantial changes to the user interface. This actually started to get a little bit more like macOS and started to provide more changes to the user interface, including centered taskbars, redesigned start menu, and the emphasis with Windows 11 was all about enhanced productivity features, improved multitasking, and better performance that catered to the evolving needs of users in a very increasingly digital world. So why did Windows really overtake the market? Well, a huge reason initially was the GUI itself. It offered a really intuitive and visually appealing way for users to interact with their computers. And this contributed to a really large widespread adoption and productivity. And then software compatibility was another driving force. The extensive compatibility that Windows was offering through the earlier iterations with a pretty diverse array of software applications really ensured that users could access and utilize this wide range of programs without compatibility issues, which compatibility issues was a very large problem in the early years of operating systems. A lot of troubleshooting was required. Another driving force were OEM partnerships or collaborations with original equipment manufacturers. So when you had other vendors like Dell and Hewlett Packard that were packing and putting together computers, partnerships were established pretty quickly that Windows would be pre-installed and a user could buy it, plug it in at home, start it up, and it was ready to go. That eliminated the initial configuration and installation of the operating system, and that made it, again, easier for users to use out of the box. And then finally, business integration, and that's probably the most important one out of all of these here. Windows' capability to seamlessly integrate with enterprise environments and business processes, that's truly what positioned it as the preferred choice for companies and ultimately solidified its popularity in the market. 
for example, if you had a team of 10 that all needed to get up and running with Windows Office software like Word and Excel back in the day, you could easily administer and manage all those users from a centralized Windows server. And you could buy hardware with Windows pre-configured that you could just buy as a giant package, power it all on, have a sysadmin or a system administrator do some light configuration and your business is up and running. And that was pretty groundbreaking, really. And the rest of the competition and operating systems were very far behind from ever getting close to that at the time. So how does Windows generally work? Well, it's an operating system, so all of the basics that we covered in the previous lecture are all applicable over here. It's efficiently just allocating and managing hardware resources such as memory and CPU time, and it provides users with a very consistent interface for interacting with their computers. And then we have this kernel space versus user space concept over here, and we talked about the kernel in the previous lecture about its functionality. And remember that the kernel is really the heart of the operating system and manages these critical functions like memory management, process scheduling, and device interaction. And then Windows separated the rest into user space, on the other hand, which are applications and user processes, like you're running Chrome. And this is sort of like a container so that you as the user shouldn't be going and messing around with the kernel itself. So this delineation is functional by the concept of system calls. And this is where you as the user operating a program when you're running it, it may require service from the operating system, such as reading from or writing to a file. And it does this by initiating a system call. And these calls serve as sort of like a gateway for the applications to access kernel level functionalities, enabling tasks like hardware interaction, file management on disk, and communication. So let's get a little bit more specific with the kernel itself and talk about some of the responsibilities here. The kernel really residing at the core of the operating system ensures that various process and applications can run smoothly without conflicts. And it does this by enforcing security and privilege levels. And these are access controls, really. And they are assigning privilege levels to users and processes to dictate what they can and cannot do. This involves authenticating users with credentials, granting permissions, and protecting sensitive data from unauthorized access so that things don't get corrupted or maliciously interacted with. And then we have this layer where the device drivers residing in kernel space will be acting as the intermediaries between the hardware components and the operating system to ensure that the hardware can provide the resources that the operating system needs that the user is requesting. And then we get into user space where you yourself can interact with the operating system. And it begins with processes and threads. Each process represents an independent program or application that you might be using. And inside of that, it contains one or more threads that allow concurrent execution. Threads within a process share resources and data. And this is only possible because of memory management, which the operating system oversees for memory allocation, ensuring that applications receive the necessary memory resources without conflicting with one another. And what this really means is that the space allocated for one process and memory is then separated and shouldn't be interfering or encroaching with another process's memory space allocated for it. And then there's this thing called the registry, which really is just like a centralized repository that holds configuration settings for system preferences and user specific data, like your desktop background. It essentially acts like a database for applications and the operating system to access crucial information and a consistent user experience. And then finally, there are these things called DLLs or dynamic link libraries. And these are just files that you would see on the desktop or your documents folder. And what these really are, are just collections of reusable code modules that multiple applications can share. And this permits applications to access these pre-existing code modules without needing to duplicate it or for the software developers to write it themselves all over again, reinventing the wheel. And ultimately, this just leads to more efficient memory usage and easier maintenance by the operating system and software developers as well, too, writing the applications. And so that's a lot of general technical knowledge and jargon all at once. So let's maybe walk through it as a process if you were to open up an application like Chrome. So what happens is there's you, the user request that's taking place right now. And this is when you interact with an application, such as clicking its icon or entering a command. The operating system recognizes your request to launch the application. Then you have something where the application needs to load. So the operating system identifies the location of the application's executable file, 
with the .exe extension in Windows typically on the storage device, allowing it to be accessed for execution. And then we have this process creation moment where upon initiating the application, the operating system generates a new process. And this process provides an isolated environment where the application can operate independently with its own memory space and resources. And then we have memory allocation. So to support the application's execution, the operating system allocates a portion of the computer's memory for the application. This memory space is then used to store the application's code, data, and other resources that it needs. And then we have resource loading. So the operating system at this stage starts to load the application's code and associated resources into the allocated memory space. These resources can include graphical assets like icons, images, as well as any other data really required for the application to function properly. And then it moves into a stage of dependency resolution. So if the application is relying on external resources known as these DLLs that we just talked about, the operating system ensures that the necessary DLLs are also loaded into memory. And remember that these DLLs just contain a reusable code, and that's why if an application needs it, it will be loaded into memory along with the application. And then a couple more layers happen. We have thread creation. So once the process is now established, memory allocation and DLLs have been loaded, the operating system generates individual threads within that process. And these threads allow different tasks within the application to run concurrently. And then we move into the initialization stage. So the application's code that is responsible for initializing various elements, including variables, settings, and components necessary for the application to run properly are now initialized. And this stage is preparing the application for its intended functionality. Next, we move to the user interface setup. So this is actually finally when you'll start to see the application load. So if the application features a GUI, like this Chrome browser, the operating system sets up the interface components, such as creating windows, buttons, menus, and other graphical elements that you can interact with. And now you can finally use the Chrome browser. So now as you engage with the application's GUI, clicking on buttons, inputting text, generating content, these messages are relayed to the application for processing, allowing it to respond to your interactions which leaves us finally in just general execution phase. At this point, the application is carrying out tasks and operations that it was designed for and supported by the threads that were spawned with it. And now what's happening is system calls are being made, which dial back down to the kernel and then to the hardware and then right back the way it came to what you see in front of you. That's pretty impressive all that's happening under the hood but that's effectively what happens at a high level when you open up the chrome browser